All right, welcome everyone. My name is Bailey Breinig, the session host for Amanda Janke and her presentation on how to promote textbook affordability online. The Wisconsin Open Education Symposium is committed to being a safe, accessible, equitable, and inclusive environment for all. Our code of conduct is in effect during the session and in all conference spaces. Please take a moment to reflect on how your actions can build up our open education community and support diverse voices. In this session, uh, it'll be recorded and caption will be available in future viewing. If you have any questions, uh, we'll be doing a Q&A at the end of the session. Thanks for joining us today. Hi guys, um, my name is Amanda Jakey and I'm currently the library specialist in the acquisitions department at Winthrop University in Rock Hill, South Carolina. And today I'm going to be talking to you about how to promote textbook affordability online. And this is obviously important as it meets students where they are online and it provides them with key resources that will save the money, which everyone loves to do. So let's get started. It'll go to the next slide. There we go. So first, I wanted to let you all know a little bit about myself and why I'm in a position to be able to tell you how to promote textbook affordability and have you trust me. So I'm currently pursuing my master's degree in library and information science at the University of North Carolina at Greensboro, where I hope to graduate in May of 2024. And my program is 100% online. So I'm currently living in Charlotte, North Carolina, where I commute to Rock Hill, South Carolina every day and work at the Dacus Library at Winthrop University. And I just started this job in August. So before this, I was given the opportunity to do a fellowship at the Atkins Library at the University of North Carolina at Charlotte. And there I was the textbook affordability fellow and I worked under the open education librarian with whom I spent this past summer conducting extensive research and using the information I gathered to create a website for the school. And this website provided both students and faculty alike with the information and resources they needed to navigate textbook affordability and understand it a little better. So if you haven't guessed already, that website and the research I did to inform my choices is what I'll be talking about today. All right, so now that you know my credentials, I'm going to give you a quick overview of what I'll be discussing in my presentation. So first, I'll be giving you a quick background on the importance of my website. This fall semester that we're in right now was UNCC's first semester as part of an inclusive access program. And for anyone who may be unfamiliar with what that means, I'm going to tell you how it affects the textbook affordability movement and how it affected my website. And then I'll talk about the interviews I conducted with librarians at other schools who are part of the same inclusive access program and their experience with it. And then after that, I'll show you some web pages that I looked to that I felt were important additions to my website and why. And finally, in the main event, my website. I'll show you the choices I made and how it looks all together. So first, what is inclusive access? Great question. Inclusiveaccess.org defines it simply as a textbook sales model that adds the cost of digital course content into students' tuition and fees. Ideally, it is available on the first day of class through the school's learning management system. And if students choose not to be a part of the program, they have a small period of time to opt out before they are billed through their tuition. And once the semester is over, students usually lose access to this content. And I'm sure in that definition alone, you could probably figure out how it affects the textbook affordability movement, but let me give you some specific examples. And again, these are all from inclusiveaccess.org, which is a really great res resource for all things inclusive access. So just as I said before, students typically no longer have permission to use inclusive access content after the course ends, when we all know OERs are available wherever, whenever, and then along with this, instructors' freedom to choose their course materials that best meets their students' needs is constrained with inclusive access, when OERs allow you to pick and choose from as many resources as you wish. And then finally, I really liked how um, the website said this, less expensive is not the same thing as affordable. Inclusive access programs try to say that they are part of the textbook affordability movement because they can be a cheaper option for some people, but cheaper isn't free, like OERs are. 
So yeah, this is what UNCC and a lot of other schools are dealing with right now. And it hurts the textbook, affordabil textbook affordability movement tremendously. And now when I was doing my fellowship this past summer, UNCC librarians had no idea what to expect when their inclusive access program went into full effect. And in order to soften the blow just a tiny bit by gathering some insight, I interviewed some librarians at other schools in the same program. I wanted to know how they were continuing to promote textbook affordability on a campus that may not be listening as hard anymore. So here are the schools I was able to talk to. And after the fact, we noticed that they were all from the South, which can be interpreted any way you like. Um, I won't bore you with all the specific details of my interviews, but I will tell you the key takeaways from each one that informed my research the greatest. So first, at Sam Houston State University, ebook versions of the textbooks faculty chose weren't always available, but if students opted for a print version, it took six to eight weeks to arrive, which kind of goes against the whole get your materials on the first day of classes thing that inclusive access, you know, likes to boast. And then we have the University of Alabama at Birmingham, whose librarian did not even know his school was a part of an inclusive access program, which meant that nobody was communicating with the library. And at Winston-Salem State University, their librarian told me she believed they stopped being a part of their inclusive access program after three years because it hurt students more than it helped them. My interview with the University of North Carolina at Greensboro was arguably the most important because their environment was the closest to UNCC's. So if it was affecting them, we knew it would affect UNCC, which of course it was big time. There's only one school left in this specific inclusive access program that doesn't automatically opt students into their program, which as you can imagine can be problematic. So when the librarian at UNCG fought against automatic opt-in, she said she was told that students are smart, they'll know to opt out, but went on to say that they didn't actually trust students to opt in if given the opportunity. And then the saddest interview I had was with a librarian at Coastal Carolina University, who at that point had pretty much given up on promoting textbook affordability on her campus because she, was, she no longer had the backing or resources to do so because of her inclusive access program. And then Central Florida University is that last school that doesn't have automatic opt-in, but even still students on their campus set up a petition against the inclusive access program and created an organization for textbook affordability on their own accord. So we can see how well even automatic opt-out works. And at Florida International University, the librarian told me that faculty complained about their choices of books through the bookstore while many students didn't even realize they were automatically opted in because of lack of transparency from the bookstore and then ended up buying their textbooks twice. And then finally, the University of Southern Mississippi seemed to be having a grand time with their inclusive access program, which it was nice to get some positivity in there, but they were the only ones that had anything positive to say. So once I was depressed from all my interviews, I cheered myself up with some successful textbook affordability promotion websites. I'm going to show you a few screenshots of web pages that I thought were super helpful. All right, so first up, we have the University of North Florida's textbook adoption deadline page, and this is geared more towards those who have an inclusive access program, but I'm sure faculty at any school could appreciate a reminder of their deadlines. I thought this was extremely important to add because if a faculty member does not make their textbook choice known on time, the students risk not receiving their books on the first day. And then along with this, it was also important to let students know the deadline for opting out of the program if they so choose to do so, because by reminding them of the deadline, we're reminding them that they still have a choice. And then next is a page from the University of South Florida's textbook affordability project website, which is a really cool site if you've never been on it before. I focused on their buying textbooks online page because I thought it was important to provide students with cheaper resources if they wanted to look outside the bookstore. This is especially important for schools in an inclusive access program because if students decide to opt out, they need to know where else they can find their books if they can't depend on the bookstore. 
And then I thought the places that USF shared were great places to start. And then lastly, we have the University of Texas at Rio Grande Valley's Contact Us page. Obviously, our job as librarians is to help people, and this is a great way to allow people to easily get in contact with you. Plus, you don't want to tell someone, be pro textbook affordability, and then throw them in the deep end without any help or context or resources. So I thought it would be important to create multiple contact forms like UTRGV did. So when people have different kinds of questions, they won't be all filling out the same form and it'd be left to some poor librarian to read through them all and sort them. Instead, they know what to expect when they receive a filled out form and can take it from there. So now for the main event, my website. After all that background information, you're probably wondering what the final product looks like. So let's go find out. All right, so here on the home page, we have some facts about the cost of textbooks. I wanted to add this to the very first page you see so that you're reminded why textbook affordability and OERs are so important. I mean, like, for example, 11% of students reporting skipping meals just to afford their books. That's insane, right? So I included that. And below that is just quick links to the most important page in each, in each section, in my opinion. All right, so the first section over here is understanding textbook affordability, and the first tab will teach you about OERs. I put one of the many definitions of OERs. This one in particular I took from the University of South Carolina because I had just seen them present on their newly formed OER repository, and I liked how they described it. And then I put a why OER section. And this is important, especially for schools dealing with inclusive access, because unfortunately, money can no longer be the main argument when it comes to OERs. Inclusive access is technically saving students money, depending on their situation. So you can't really use that when you're arguing for OERs. Instead, you can use these other resources, other reasons. Um, they're adoptable and customizable, and they're always available, that kind of thing. And then, of course, we have our five rights of OER, which I made myself in Canva. I was very proud of that. And that is UNCC's um, mascot, not a random man. And then next, we have library license materials, which are free to faculty and students that belong to the institution the library is part of. So here I explain what library license materials are, and then underneath that, we put a search bar that takes you straight to the library's catalog. So UNCC's wonderful e-resources librarian coded this for me, and if we type in a book, it'll take us to the library's website. And this is super helpful in that you don't have to go to the library's website to search for something. You can do it right on my website while you do some important research on textbook affordability. And then this final tab, Niner Course Pack, is the name of UNCC's inclusive access program since their mascot is the 49ers. And here is where I put that definition of inclusive access along with the two types of models so that students and faculty can better understand what it entails to be in an inclusive access program. And so the bookstore didn't think I was trying to fight them by making this website. I put a video they made about the Niner course pack from their perspective. Because like I said, this does technically save students money and we can't discredit that. And then, so once they have a better understanding of the different kinds of textbooks affordability, students can click on the student resource tab and to find some important information about their textbooks. So first up is course reserves. The library does have print versions of some textbook, textbooks available for an allotted amount of time. And this is where students can search to see if the library has their specific textbook. So once again, we have a beautifully made search bar and this one comes with a drop down menu so you can search for your textbook in different ways. So, for example, if I was looking for my psych book, I would type in my course code. And there it is, and it lets you know that it's at the circulation desk and that you can check it out for an hour at a time. Now, if a student isn't familiar with searching for their books or with the whole checking out books process, 
I put a step by step below the search bar. And of course, we want to make sure that they're searching for the right textbook. So I showed them where they can look to see which class the textbook belongs to, and they can match it themselves. And then after that quick walkthrough, we have this important message right down here. Some course reserves may be available electronically and are available with unlimited access, no checkouts required. Check to see if there's an electronic version on the e course eTooksbooks website webpage. And then that is the next tab right here. So first and foremost, the library obviously wants to get ahead of broken links. So we put a link to one of the contact forms report an access issue so that the library can make sure access is available for everyone all the time. And this time we have the catalog embedded into the website so that it is easier to separate physical from electronic, but it all works the same. So if I type in my textbook, there it is. And it has all the same information that it would have on the library catalog. All right, and then of course the library doesn't have every single textbook, unfortunately. So that is where the Niner course pack would come in. And at the very top, there are those deadlines I was talking about earlier. And right, right underneath that is the link to opt out if they so choose. And next to those deadlines is a plea to students to please do their research on if this is the best option for them, because a lot of times it's not. And if they decide that it's not, I put some resources here for them, thanks to USF. There's a list of textbook sellers where students can look to find their textbook. And then there's comparison tools so that students can make sure they are finding the cheapest option they can. All right, and then now we're going to switch over to the other audience we're trying to reach, faculty. So here, faculty can learn how to teach with OERs, as well as learn where to find them or how to create them themselves. And of course, I give some resources on the Niner course pack as well. So on this page, I give some examples on how professors could use OERs in their classes, because some may want to support the cause, but don't know how. And then I put some ways that professors can evaluate an OER that they want to use, because a big misconception of OERs is that they're phony textbooks or that they aren't peer reviewed. So just in case someone was still skeptical, I wanted to provide ways professors could do their own research on an OER that they may want to use. And then at the very top of this page is a link to another contact form that might sound familiar because it was one of the ones that UT RGV's website used. This form will come in handy because it allows the library to recognize faculty who are using OERs or library license materials. And with that information, we can collect data or simply give them a spotlight and thank them for their work. So after the forum, I put an understanding Creative Commons section because it is very important for faculty to understand how flexible OERs are under this licensing. But it also lets them know that if they were to create an OER themselves, their work wouldn't be in vain because it can be used around the world freely and they'll still get all the credit. And then I thought this infographic from Wikimedia was extremely helpful to show that um, there are different kinds of licensing. And so that faculty could be aware that even though everything is free, there are still different levels of strictness when it comes to Creative Commons licensing. And that they should be on the lookout for what kind of license the OERs they choose have. And then next, I put plenty of different OER repositories for faculty to look through to find a resource they like. There are a few specialized repositories as well, so I thought I'd include those to make it a little easier for faculty in those departments. And if a faculty member would like to create their own OER, I made sure to include some resources for them as well so they know what they're getting themselves into. There's some platforms where they can create their own OERs, and then there's OERs on how to make OERs. And of course, they can always collaborate with the librarian as well. But for those who want to work independently, I provided plenty of resources for them to get started. And then finally, we have the Niner course pack.
The first thing is those super important deadlines and the reminder that their students are depending on them in order to get their textbooks on the first day. After that, I provided some tips on how faculty can help their students navigate this inclusive access program as well as save them the most money. And then to make things easiest for faculty, I provided a link to the place where they would submit their textbook selection for the Niner course pack. And just in case they aren't sure how to do such a thing, the bookstore was kind enough to provide a step-by-step -step video to ensure faculty input their books correctly. And there are also other things that the Adoptions and Insights portal can do besides record a faculty member's book selection, and those are listed here as well, so that faculty can get the most out of this technology. And now, before I go on to the contact page, I wanted to include one more final tab that is extremely important for outreach purposes, but it's hidden on this website right now, and that is a faculty spotlight page. For those faculty members who do use OERs, I think it's extremely important to give them a space to show their face and have them talk about their experience using an OER. Because not only does this show that the library appreciates faculty that use OER tremendously, but it also provides other faculty who may be thinking about adopting an OER an example that it can be done. Also, faculty members may be more comfortable talking to other faculty rather than a librarian and a faculty spotlight page gives them plenty of contacts to reach out to to ask questions. And like I said, it's hidden on this website because the faculty using OER at UNCC haven't been rounded up for questioning just yet, but I wanted to make sure I talked about it still. Okay, so last but certainly not least, we've got the contact us page. I've already talked about the last two forms in here, so I'll just focus on the first two. The first form requests a consultation allows for anyone who wants to learn more about textbook affordability to book an appointment with the librarian to learn about more resources or to get walked through the resources provided. There's also an option to do just the, the consultation through email if it's a quick question or the person is more comfortable not being face to face. And this is an important form to have because you don't want students and faculty to have to interpret this information all on their own. It is a lot to take in, and there's definitely room to go into more detail on certain aspects if they are curious about one specific thing. And then next we have the course ebook request. This allows for faculty members to inquire about their textbooks to see if there's an online version that can be used for more accessibility for students, which is a great first step for textbook affordability. And if someone wanted to talk to someone specific, I put three librarians willing to talk about this stuff that have three very different jobs. So there is a great range for the person choosing. So yeah, that is my website on textbook affordability. Feel free to steal any of my ideas for your own online promotion or email me for links to specific resources or the website itself and I will gladly hand any of that over. And there's my contact information on that email. Um, and now, is there any questions? There was one question. Um, they were wondering if we could put the link to your website in the chat here today. Yeah, definitely. Let me stop and grab that link. I gotta get to the chat. There we go. You. Perfect. Thank you. That was the only one that was given during the presentation. Does anyone else have questions for Amanda? All right. All right. I don't think so, but um, she did include all of her information. So if you do have questions, you can let her know. But thank you very much, Amanda. Thank you so much. Have a good day, everyone.